it's not only our life support systems, which are gravely threatened and threatened above all other factors by um, the way that we farm, but it's also um, our own survival because these, these means of farming are, are profoundly damaging to future food security. Tonight, we will discuss the future of food with none other than George Monbiot. George is a zoologist, a journalist, and most importantly, perhaps, an environmental advocate. I think he's changed the language of climate activism, and since 1985, or perhaps even before that, you don't know better than I do, he has been consistently been telling people what they don't want to hear. George is quite literally brewing up a food revolution. Please give him a very warm applause. Thanks, everyone, for coming. We, as environmentalists, have been pretty good. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> we, we, well, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I've... <laughs> we got a new moderator. <laughs> So, um, I'm, I'm not going to hand the stage over, but um, <laughs> tempting as it is. Um, we've been pretty good at campaigning against fossil fuels, campaigning against the chemicals industry, the plastic industry, campaigning against the construction industry, all the various forces that have been trashing the living planet. All the various forces except one, the one which happens to be the primary cause of environmental destruction. And we don't want to go there. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want even to admit it to ourselves because it is so deeply woven into the warp and weft of our identity, of our culture. We've been doing it so long. It's not quite the oldest profession, but it's not far off. It is, of course, farming. Now, farming, obviously, we all need it. We depend entirely upon it for our survival. But we also have to admit to ourselves that it is the world's number one cause of habitat destruction, the world's number one cause of wildlife loss, the world's number one cause of species extinction, of soil degradation, of fresh water use, and most importantly, and I'll be coming to this in a moment, of land use, the great neglected environmental issue. It's one of the top causes of climate breakdown, of water pollution, and of air pollution. But we create a kind of moral force field around it with a no trespassing sign in front. Don't go there. Don't talk about this issue. Blame anything else, but not food and farming. And if we do criticize farming, we put the word intensive in front of it. And sure, there are many, many problems with intensive farming. If we look at arable farming, the growing of crops, well, it's pesticides. Um, it's the extraordinary amount of fertilizer. You in uh, the Netherlands will be well aware of um, certain issues surrounding the amount of, of nitrate going in, in into the ecosystem issues which the government managed to completely ignore for about 40 years before it landed like a ton of bricks on its head in 2019. But yes, we're fully aware of the enormous damage being done by pesticides, the enormous damage done by the amount of nitrate and phosphate with which we're loading the ecosystem, the unsustainable levels of water use for irrigation and the tremendous soil degradation that this is causing. I mean, soil, the ecosystem, from which 99% of our calories come. Perhaps the most abundant, diverse, fascinating ecosystem of all. A biological structure like a coral reef built by the organisms that live within it. There would be no soil if it were not for those organisms. And yet, we treat it like dirt. And we are degrading it. We're ripping it apart at such a state that there is just no way we are going to get through this century without a radical about turn on the way that we treat this and other precious resources. 
So we know all about intensive farming and we are very ready to criticise intensive farming and all those criticisms are valid. And we should be casting the spotlight on every one of those issues that I have mentioned. But the problem is not the adjective. The problem is the noun. Because when you talk about intensive farming, the obvious alternative is extensive farming. And extensive farming means, by definition, using more land to produce a given amount of food. And I've come to believe, after so many years as an environmentalist, that land is the, perhaps the most important of all environmental issues. And yet we discuss it only when we discuss urban sprawl the entire urban area of the planet. All the homes, all the buildings, the businesses, the infrastructure, the entire planet occupy 1% of its land surface. It should be less. It's, it's, it's a profligate way of using the land, but it is 1% of the land surface. A lot of the land surface is desert or mountain or ice cap. Some of it, but far too little, is protected areas and some of it, but far too little, is forest. But the biggest land use of all is farming. While we use 1% for building, we use 38% of the planet's land use for farming. And you think, OK, we're growing a lot of crops. Well, actually, not so much, because only 12% of the land surface is under crops. And incidentally, almost half of that land is used to provide crops to feed livestock. But what about the rest? What's that 26% which makes up the 38%? Where does that come from? All that is grazing livestock, mostly cattle and sheep, which between them produce a tiny proportion of our food, but occupy the lion's share of the land. Grazing livestock alone is by far the biggest land use worldwide of anything that humans do. And why is this important? Because every hectare we use for our own purposes is a hectare we cannot use for wild ecosystems. It's a hectare that can't be occupied by forests, by wetlands, by savannas, by wild grasslands. At sea, every hectare we trawl is a hectare which can't be occupied by natural seafloors, by kelp, kelp forests, by coral reefs and the rest of it. It's the opportunity cost of land use or indeed sea use which is perhaps the most important issue of all. And we can divide it into two main areas, ecological opportunity cost and carbon opportunity cost. The great majority of the world's species require wild ecosystems for their survival. They cannot live in, in a place where we have an extractive industry. And while you can have forms of farming which have more wildlife than other forms of farming, uh, in the great majority of cases, it's the wild ecosystems which have more wildlife, a greater diversity and abundance than any form of farming. In almost all cases, wild ecosystems contain more carbon than, than farmed ecosystems of any kind. So, for instance, to give a, a case which is probably pretty similar to the Netherlands in England, according to the government's um, Climate Change Committee, um, um, if you move from pastured livestock to a forest ecosystem, to a woodland, the soil alone will come to contain 25 tonnes of extra carbon per hectare by comparison to pasture. And then there's all the carbon in the trees as well. So by keeping huge amounts of land in farming, we are preventing very large amounts of carbon from being drawn down from the atmosphere and preventing ecosystems which would otherwise be there from existing. So we have a problem here on the other side of the divide caused by extensive farming. The problem is not intensive farming or extensive farming, but a disastrous combination of the two. And these together form the biggest threat to the living world, to earth systems and to human survival. Everywhere now, we see foodies and celebrity chefs advocating that the best thing you can eat is pasture-fed meat. And look, it sequesters carbon in the soil and it's, um, it, can, it can restore ecosystems. 
Well, there is um, a large review article published um, at Oxford University's Martin School look, looking at 300 references. It didn't find a single case in which any pasture system can um, sequester more carbon than the greenhouse gases that the, that the cattle or the sheep produce. Um, so ruminant animals like cattle and sheep, particularly when they're feeding on grass, produce large amounts of methane and nitrous oxide, which are very important, greenhouse gases, and those greatly overwhelm the, any positive impact you might get from... <laughs> she's fallen asleep. I hope this is the only, only person in the house who's fallen asleep. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. This is very interesting. Um, um, and this greatly over overwhelms any carbon that you, that you can save. And also, you know, um, by comparison to the natural ecosystems which might have been there, you've still got that massive carbon opportunity cost. So you've got your carbon current account, which is almost always in debt in any agricultural system, and your carbon capital account, which is always in debt, and massively so in any agricultural system. But some people say, well, look, you know, here's, you know, here we are with systems where you can have a small amount of cattle and you've got more wildlife than there would be if it was just continuous woodland cover. And it's true that you can create what ecologists call an intermediate disturbance regime, which can be very rich in, in a wide variety of habitats and, and wildlife. You, have, you create a mosaic of habitats by having some grazing animals and you know, we need grazing animals, we need herbivores. They are an important part of the ecosystem. And the cow, which is, whose ancestor was native to Europe, is um, a, a grazing animal which can be very useful. But when you look at what systems like that are based on, it's absolutely tiny numbers of livestock. So this word regenerative, right, which has been slapped in front of everything. Regenerative ranching, formerly known as ranching. It's a bit like the word sustainable. You know, you sort of take whatever you're doing and you just put that word in front, problem solved. There we are. It's sustainable. It's regenerative. So um, this, the, the absolute minimum baseline for regenerative, where ecology is concerned, is permitting trees to return to a formerly forested landscape. If there were trees there before, um, just getting the trees back is the absolute minimum definition of regeneration. In order for that to happen, your stocking levels have to be so low that they cannot make any meaningful contribution to food production whatsoever. So I looked at this in two cases in the UK and sort of in the uplands where the soil is poorer, the climate is harsher, you'd have to bring your sheep numbers down to five per square kilometre. In other words, one sheep per 20 hectares to allow even the minimum base, any trees at all, to grow. And that's because animals like sheep and cattle, they love tree seedlings. Um, tree seedlings are highly nutritious and they seek them out and they're very good at finding them. And if they're above that tiny, tiny number, they will find those seed seedlings and they will eat them and there will be no trees. These are the greatest agents of deforestation anywhere on earth are ruminant animals. In the UK, we're a highly urbanised nation, 7% of the nation is a built environment, 51% is grazing land, and that is kept bare by those animals. In fact, they make it bare in the, in the hills of Wales and Scotland. Um, there, there are forests, but when you allow the sheep in, which unfortunately is all too often the case, because they, the baby trees, there's nothing to replace the big trees when they die, and they're dead on their, their feet, those forests. The big trees fall over, and then the forest is gone. You don't need to cut them down with an axe. You cut them down with a sheep. This is the biggest threat to our ecosystems, um, our, our terrestrial ecosystems, um, uh, our ecologies in the UK. Um, and, and then and the lowlands, there, I looked at um, a, a case called the Net Wildland Project, which is um, a very good and celebrated project, which has brought a lot of wildlife back to its land. And this is in a very fertile part of the country with a very warm, good climate. And they're producing just 54 kilos of meat per hectare per year. If you were to extrapolate that across all the agricultural land area of the United Kingdom, we would each have 75 um, calories of meat per day and nothing else. In other words, one thirtieth of our calorific requirement and no other foods whatsoever. 
And what, what can you conclude from this? Well, first of all, if this was the way we were going to produce meat, only millionaires would eat it. All right? It would be a super luxury product. It would be like bluefin tuna or beluga caviar. Secondly, this is a completely different thing from a production system. So you've got your conservation grazing, which in some, I'd say only a few cases, is, is a relevant and useful great, um, conservation tool. A lot of the time you just have to let nature get on with it because there's so much damage to restore that ruminant animals actually impede that restoration. But in a few cases you can say this is relevant and it has tiny, tiny productivity. So we put it over there on the production scale and then you have this other thing called commercial animal grazing, producing meat and milk for the market. It's a totally different system. It has totally different ecological impacts um, where you have, um, uh, I mean, it's not, none of it's commercial actually because there would be no grazing animals in Europe at all if it weren't for farm subsidies. The whole thing is propped up by the taxpayer. We're paying for profound ecological harm by subsidizing the livestock industry. But, but to produce anything uh, quasi-commercial livestock farming you reduce your flora and all the associated wildlife to almost zero. You know, why don't we have large predators in, in many parts of Europe? I know they're slowly coming back to the Netherlands, but because they can't buy ferry tickets, they're not yet in the UK, because of resistance from the livestock industry. Why are large predators being persecuted all over the world? Because of the livestock industry. Um, why are wild herbivores fenced out? of huge tracts of pasture because of the livestock industry? Why are we killing all our badgers in the UK because of the livestock industry? We talk about wildlife-human conflicts, but in most cases, they're actually wildlife-livestock conflicts. The livestock has to be cleared, the wildlife has to be cleared out of the way to make way for the livestock. And in fact, one study looked at the impact of taking livestock off the land and found that there's only one guild, in other words, functional ecological group of animals which benefits from that, and those are the ones which eat livestock poo, manure. And all the other um, guilds, um, uh, sorry, only one guild which benefits from having livestock on the land, all the other guilds benefit from the livestock being taken off. So we have this real crisis, and it's a double crisis because it, it, it's not only our life support systems, which are gravely threatened and threatened above all other factors by um, the way that we farm, but it's also um, our own survival because these, these means of farming are, are profoundly damaging to future food security. So there's a more or less a scientific consensus around the idea that by 2050 we'll need about 50% more food. You need an extra 146% of water use worldwide, this paper calculated. But already we, we're overusing water. There isn't any more. We can't use more. In fact, we have to use less than we're using already. Soil degradation I've mentioned already. Climate breakdown is hammering agriculture in many of the world's most important food baskets. And that is being exacerbated greatly by agriculture itself. I mean, livestock alone produce about 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than the transport industry. There are only two things you need to do to prevent climate breakdown, leave fossil fuels in the ground and stop farming animals. And it's quite striking that after 27 climate summits, not a single declaration from any of them even mentions either aim. They had two jobs, and they haven't even mentioned either of them after 27 years. It's an extraordinary... I mean, you know, they're designed to fail. They're just designed to keep us talking so that they don't have to act. That's what it's about. If they intended to succeed, there wouldn't have been COPs 2 to 27. They would have sorted it out in COP 1, like they did with ozone depletion at the Montreal summit. One summit, all the major issues sorted out. The rest is details after that. It, it's total failure and it's failure by design and the same with the biodiversity con convention talks too.